loud. Is this the magic time? Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me okay in the back? Yeah? A little bit too high? What? It's too low. So I should, should put the volume up? Okay. Is that better? How's that? Okay. Ready? Unfortunately, Anna is not feeling very well. She has a cold. I don't know. She said, don't worry, it's not COVID, but actually it feels worse, so to be honest. Um, okay, I think it's the magic time. So, uh, welcome, E16A, woo! Again, I have to say thank you so much for uh, coming in person and lecture. Uh, for those of you here, really, truly appreciate it. It's such a, such a nicer experience for me and hopefully also for you. It's really one of the best ways to keep, uh, keep you know, uh, in sync with the class and see kind of what's going on, know what you're talking about, what they're talking about in the discussions. And really, um, just a good time to uh, kind of absorb the uh, Berkeley uh, spirit because, uh, you know, sitting at home watching on a video, I think you've done that for the past two years anyway. So maybe try something new. I'm talking to those online, not talking to you because obviously you're here. Uh, so intro up folks. folks. Uh, by the way, intro up folks, there's a chance for you to maybe if you think that you kind of lost thing. We're going to start a new model next week, module next week about circuits. So it's an opportunity for you to start catching up. Oh, by the way, uh, we're going to start a new model, module next week. Yeah. So you're going to hear more of Anna than uh, you're going to hear from me. Uh, hopefully, with a little bit of interruptions. What we, uh, oh, oh, oh. So this week, we're going to talk. Pretty much two, uh, two lectures are going to concentrate to the, um, to the topic of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And it's one of those things that you kind of like, what the heck are we, you doing this for? What is this? This is like, I don't understand this. Like, why, why is it useful? And I have to tell you, among the things that you learn in class, the concepts of eigenvalues uh, and eigenvectors is one of the most important ones because they tell you so much so much about the system capability. You know, like we learn about invertibility, we learn about linear dependence, and those give you some idea. But eigenvalues and eigenvectors, wow, if you know them, 
then you really don't need to know even the matrix. If you know the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the matrix, you really don't need to know the matrix. You know what the matrix is actually doing to you know, signals or vectors that are coming in. So that is extremely, extremely useful uh, concept. But we need to kind of catch up a little bit on, um, on, um, on last time. And um, last time we talked about vector spaces, blah, 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 vector spaces, subspaces, blah, 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 definition, definition. All of these are ex also very important in terms of both understanding the language. But once you've described something as a vector space, as a subspace, there's good properties for that so that you can leverage in order to, uh, to show things about a system. Um, we talked about null spaces, kind of, just at the end. And I'm going to focus more about today. In fact, all eigenvalues and eigenvectors all are derived from null spaces, right? So it's, it's really relevant to that. So we'll talk about that today. Uh, today we're going to talk about computing the determinant because we haven't, and then eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the matrix. I'm going to give you some kind of examples of page rank, which is really uh, kind of the basis of how web search, uh, at least by Google and other, other web searchers work. Um, so we'll start with that. So we had all these jargons, rank. We talked about rank of a matrix, which is really the size of the dimension, right, of the, uh, of the column space or the number of linearly independent columns in a matrix. Um, I mentioned null space, but really it is the space for which AX equals zero. Okay, all those Xs, all those vectors, such that A, a matrix times a vector equals zero. And then I talked about vector space with all its 10 definitions. And once you have a subset of that vector space, uh, you can call it a subspace if it satisfies you know, these three conditions that we talked about as well. If it doesn't, it's a subset, but it's not a subspace. We talked about the basis, which is, the, um, which is really the minimum set of vectors that span right, a vector space. Um, we talked about kind of dimension, which is of a vector space is really the number uh, of basis vectors. Column space is really the span or the range of the columns of a matrix. And row space is the same thing, but for the rows. OK, so these things we kind of discussed last time in terms of jargon. But let's focus right now on a null space. And take this, this is a big equation, super important. AX equals zero. And if you want to be concise about it and accurate about it, you probably want to, you probably also want to uh, do that, right? Realize that this zero is actually a zero vector. Wow, so here's the definition. Null space of A, which is, doesn't have to be a square matrix. It could be, could be a rectangular matrix, could be fat, could be thin. Okay, either way, um, so R of n by m, and the null space is a set of all vectors x belong in Rm, y r m, and not R n. This and like that, right? Because this is the mth size of the matrix, right? This is the n. So when you multiply like this, it only compiles when x is of size m. So x in Rm such that ax equals 0. Wow. And I showed you that x doesn't have to be 0 for that to be true. And that is the, you know, really realization that with matrices, things are a little bit different than with, with scalars. Okay. So let's, let's talk about that. We showed this examples before, example before. I had this matrix here, this one, and I asked, what is the set of vectors x in R2 such that this matrix times x equals 0? Is there this long enough? Are the columns linearly independent? They are. How many solutions? There's just one solution. That is a unique solution. The columns of a matrix are linearly independent. That means that there is just a single unique solution for the system of the equation. 
And hence, in order for that to be true, what will be then the solution? Yeah, it's the zero vector, right? So there's always a null space. The null space always exists, but this is called the trivial null space. Trivial null space is x equals zero. It's kind of like a point, right? It has zero dimensionality. It's not like a, we, we off, you know, when we have a line, then that's one dimension, we often say, but this is a point, okay? So dimensionality is zero. And so zero is always in the null space. So it's a trivial null space of a matrix. That always exists. And the question is, is there sometimes a case where you have a non-trivial null space? So there is some set of vectors such that A equals zero, but it's not the zero vector. And obviously there is, and here's an example. Here's our two vectors, uh, uh, a matrix composed of two vectors in R2. And now we have one zero and minus two zero. Are these linearly dependent? Are they, sorry, my question was, are they linearly dependent? Absolutely, they are. Uh, you know, one is just minus, uh, minus two times the other one. I'm just going to set a timer. Okay. Uh, we're going to take breaks because I want you to focus, and I think breaks are probably useful. Is that, would that work for you? So I'm going to set a break for 40 minutes. Uh, 35 minutes. There you go. Okay. Interesting. So let's do the Gauss elimination for this and try to see what's going on. So if you actually do the Gauss elimination, you go like, oh, wait, oh, that's, that's pretty easy. Basically, it immediately shows up what, what you mean. So I have a independent and dependent, right? Um, uh, uh, variables. So x2 I can choose to be whatever I want and then x1 has to be 2 times x2 just by those equations, right? So whatever I pick here then x1 has to be equal to 2x2. So x1 equals 2x2. That means that the set of solution for this set of equation are anything that can be described as something to alpha and alpha, right? Something that has this form would be a solution. And so um, this is really kind of my x. x could be anything, two, one times some alpha. That also means that my set of solution is within the span, right, of this vector, right? It's within the span of this vector. Yeah, any, any scaled version of this vector would give me a solution here. Let's, let's give it a shot. Like this, like that, you get zero, right? There you go. You know, like this, like that. If this is mi one minus two and this is two, one, you get zero. But that's true for any, any scaling. So in this case, we have a non-trivial null space, which is really the spin of the vector two, one. It's a whole space. It's a one-dimensional space in this case, right? It's a one-dimensional space that is the span of this vector. Wow, that's pretty cool. Now, how do we get from that? We know that we have linearly, you know, linearly dependent columns. That means that there's infinite solutions. Well, we can use the fact that we have a null space. We can use the fact that we have a null space to show also that we have infinite solution. I kind of showed it you last time, but we didn't even really talk about null space. So let me just rephrase it in the context of a null space. Let's say I have an equation ax equal b, and we know that some v0 is in the null space of a. That means that a has a null space. Okay? All right? That also means that a times v0 equals 0. That's definition, right, of v0 being in a null space. Okay? Hmm. Okay, let's say now we know a solution for ax equal b. A x equal b. We know a solution, okay? And we know that there is a solution which is uh, x sub zero. That is a solution, okay? So what does that mean? That means that a times x zero equals b, all right? Hmm. 
How can we get from that that there's infinite solutions? Yeah? You can add some portion of V0 to X0. That's what you're saying. And if I add it, I'm really not going to change the outcome. And the reason is, if I take X0 and add to it some alpha times V0, let me argue that also the solution is going to be B. And why is that? Because A times X0 plus alpha V0 is equal to, well, let's open those brackets, AX0, and then A times alpha V0. But A times alpha V0 is? Zero. Is zero. And A times X0 is? B. Hence, I got A times X0, A times alpha V0. This is zero. Well, this one is B, poor choice of color. And this one, this is what happens when you open those brackets. But we know that A times V0 equals zero, hence the solution is B. So now I have a whole set of solutions, like anything, any alpha times V0 that I'm going to add to my x0 is going to be a solution. So I get infinite solution. Okay. So any vectors, basically what is the null space? Null space is the dimensions that the matrix does not see. A matrix takes a vector in. An output does something to it, right? Transforms, scales, you know, rotates, reflects. But if it has a null space, anything within the null space ends up at zero. It doesn't see it. The matrix does not see those vectors. Anything that comes there is just like blind. It's the blind spot of the matrix. It will always end up at zero, whatever comes in from that direction. It's very, very useful. Very, very useful. Think about a system and let's say, oh, let's say I know I have some interference, some, some, you know, some known interference that really annoys me all the time. What if I design my matrix such that that interference is in the null space of it? So I design a system such that the interference is in the null space. Well, it's not going to affect me at all. Hmm. Right? It's always going to end up zero. It's like not going to affect my solution. So that's pretty cool, right? That's a, that's a beautiful filter. OK, so let's see, actually, when we, I haven't mentioned tomography in a while. But you remember that when uh, we did tomography and we measure like four and we said, oh, there's infinite solutions? Right? We just made four, and it says, oh, four equations for unknown, but they're linearly dependent, so we have infinite solution. Well, if we go there, what does that actually mean? Well, you can do all this, this thing you know, that we did before in the past, do all this uh, gauge elimination, not the game, but the algorithm, and then end up with x4 being a free variable, and that means that my solution, right? My solution is some alpha times 1 minus 1 minus 1, 1, right? That's, that's what it means. And so effectively, what that means is that any, any form of this actual solution plus some, something in the null space of that matrix would be a possible solution for this equation. That's why it wasn't really useful because I can add to this image that I got anything that looks like that, and it's, I'm gonna, still going to get a valid result that's consistent with my measurement, but it's still not going to look right. So I really, in order to get the image back, I need another equation. That's how it relates to that. So in this case, it's not a good idea. Okay? It's not a good idea to have an all space. Okay. Let's talk about rank. A rank of a matrix is really the dimension of the span of the columns of A. Okay, remember that? You look at what the matrix A spans, it's the size of the dimension. If I have a three by three matrix and all the columns are linearly independent, A spans a three by three matrix, linearly independent, A spans R3, entire R3. 
What is the rank of that matrix? The rank is three. That's right. The rank of the matrix can only be as high as the minimum between M and N. You know, the size of the matrix, either the, you know, the number of rows and number of columns. It cannot be more than that. So if I have a three by three matrix, linearly independent, that means that my matrix now spans R3, the rank is three, that's the maximum rank. It's also called a full rank. So when I tell you the matrix is full rank, that means that for a three by three matrix, it's three. What about a three by two matrix, full rank? Who said two? Deux points. You got 12 points. 12 points, yeah. Okay. It cannot be more than that. Okay. So rank L means that the matrix A has L independent either rows or columns. And in the homework, you had to uh, prove that. Okay. That if you have L, L you know, uh, independent rows, then it's also the, uh, the, sorry, columns, then it's also the rows. Right. Um, oh, and this is actually an interesting theorem. It's called the, people call it the rank nullity theorem. I don't like the rank nullity thing, but like here's the, here's really the gist of it. Let's say I have a matrix. And let's say it's full rank, its rank is maximum. It means a three by three matrix, for example, I have three independent columns. What's the rank? It's three. Does it have a null space? Always, but it's going to be the, uh, the trivial null space, right? So the dimension of the null space is going to be zero because it's a three by three matrix, independent rows and columns. So it has one unique solution, you know, things like that. There's AX equals zero is only for X equals zero. Now, what if the rank was two? That means that the matrix spans a two dimensional space. You need two basis functions, ba sorry, basis vectors, in order to represent the range of that matrix. OK? You need two. Well, that also means that this matrix has a null space of dimension 1. So the rank of A plus the dimension of the null space of A is always the full possible length. Right? So that's the rank nullity theorem. So if the matrix does not span the entire space, that means it has a null space. If it has a null space, the size of the null space and the size of the range of the matrix, they add to be the maximum dimensionality. Yes? So the full range is dependent on the density Yeah, full rank is the, when, the, when the rank is either the, the minimum of M and N. That's right. OK? So that's the rank nullity theorem. So just so you know about this, it's a very useful thing to know because if you know that there's two independent, two uh, independent columns out of three, then you know that the dimension of the null space is one. If there's one independent columns in the matrix A out of three, then the dimension of the null space is two. And if the matrix is zero, If the matrix is zero, well, the null space has dimension three, right? Because anything in a three-dimensional space will fall into zero. Okay, so does that make sense? Okay. So here are equivalent statements. Matrix A is invertible. AX equal B has a unique solution. We talked about that, right? Invertible also means unique solution. A has linearly independent columns. We said that. Also, now I just mentioned A is also full rank. Equivalent. You say one, you say the rest. Okay? Last time, A has a trivial null space. If it has a trivial null space, that means also that all the columns are linearly independent. The matrix is invertible. Ba, ba, ba. And then the last thing that we didn't really talk about is the determinant of A is not zero. So let's, this is what I want to talk about now. Okay, so the determinant of A. All right? Okay. So, 
for A, 2 by 2. Do you know what it, how to compute a determinant? Okay, it's like karate. Okay, first with your right hand, the diagonal you add, you add the diagonal, right? Sorry, you, you multiply the diagonals, you multiply the diagonals, and then you subtract the other diagonal, you know, multiplication of the other diagonal, right? So you multiply a by D, right hand positive, and then B times C, minus B times C. Okay, this is the determinant. Who invented this? Like why even call this property a determinant? What does it even mean? Have you thought about it? Actually, it has inter a geometrical interpretation. A determinant is actually representing in a two-dimensional space, it represents an area. In a, in a three-dimensional space, it represents volume. In a fourth-dimensional space, it represents hyper-dimensional hyper volume. Okay, whatever it means. In a fifth-dimensional space, is also hyper-dimensional, fifth-dimensional volume, and so on and so forth. Of what, though? Okay. But when the determinant of A, when you do like this, like that, like that, and it comes out to zero, well, if it's zero, then A is not invertible. Huh. Why? Well, if, if you just remember, we have for two by two, for two by two, we have an equation for invert, inverse of a matrix. Remember? Remember? Two by two, okay. And the inverse of the matrix, you know, you flip those, you negate these, and then you divide by, you divide by that. You divide by the determinant. And if this is zero, then the inverse does not exist. Okay, so, you know, it's just like, it doesn't come out of the blue. Right? It doesn't come out of the blue, the fact that A, you know, that's not invertible. It's really it's part of the calculation of the inverse in general. So that's why it's not invertible. Okay? All right. But here's the interpretation, and I'm not going to prove it to you today just for the brevity of time because I do want to talk about eigenvalues. It is in the notes. I'll just give you the gist of it, of, you know, how you go and do the interpretation of a geometrical um, um, description of the determinant. So the argument is that the determinant is really the area of a parallelogram of the two vectors, which are the columns of the matrix of the matrix. In a two by two matrix, that will be a par parallelogram that has uh, these two vectors as part of it. So in this case, if I look at the vector one zero and I look at the vector zero one, the parallelogram would be this square. And the, matri and the determinant will be the area of this particular square. If I have a different matrix, and the area is not zero, is this invertible? Yeah. It's the identity matrix. Obviously, it's invertible. Okay? It's like the same. It's inverses itself. What about this matrix? 1, 1, 1, minus 1. Let's draw the vectors. 1, 1. 1 minus 1, okay. What's the parallelogram? It's this one. Does it have an area 0? No. The matrix is, is invertible, okay. Now what about 1, 1, and 2, 2? Columns are linearly dependent in this case. Let's draw those vectors. This is 1, 1. This is 2, 2. What's the area under the parallelogram? 0. So you can kind of see that the closer these two vectors are, then the area becomes 0. 
right? The area is like nice. You know, changes, 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 small, smaller, small, 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 zero. So when the columns are linearly dependent, you get the area is zero and it's not invertible. Now, why is that? Why is AD minus BC the area of the parallelogram? Well, look at the notes, but the, um, the gist of it is that you can actually draw these. Here's the two vectors. Here are the, is the parallelogram that I was talking about. And then all you have to do is kind of like account for all those areas. So what you do is you compute the area of this big thing and then start removing pieces of it. Remove this piece and then remove this piece and then remove this piece. Each one, you calculate the area of it and then the result of it would be exactly what I just said. which is AD minus BC. I don't want to go too much into it, but this is how you go and prove it. You start with a big area and then you remove the pieces based on things that you know. And you can look it out at the, um, at the notes and see kind of how is this derived or actually these notes as well. All right, so it is the area of the parallelogram and that's why it's zero. Right, then in this class, we don't really let you compute the determinant of three by three. Why? Because it's busy work and like, I don't know why. Actually, we should, probably we will. Um, but how do you go about and compute it? Well, there is actually an kind of, it's an interesting algorithm to do it. it it's kind of like a recursive. Okay, it's a recursive algorithm that also extends into a four by four. So what you do, is you look at the you look at the three by three matrix, and then you look at the first row, and then you pick the first element, and you pick the first element, and then you eliminate its row and column, and then what you say, oh, we can now compute the determinant of this two by two matrix that's left, okay, and then multiply by a. All right, so this is this component. You take A and you multiply by the determinant of whatever is left, okay? But that's not it. the rest of it because now I need to look at B. And with B, I also remove um, this one and this one and this one and this one. And so now I have a two by two matrix here. But now because I moved one, I'm gonna use the negative sign and then again, a determinant, okay? And then, then the last one is C, so then I remove this and this, and now I have a determinant of this matrix times C, and now it's with a plus sign. So you start with a plus, negative, plus, okay? So effectively, by knowing how to do a two by two, you can now do a three by three, as long as you follow the rule of a plus, minus, plus. How do you do a four by four? You take a four by four, you take the first element, you remove all the elements in the row and column, now you end up with a three by three, which you know how to solve. And then you do the plus, minus, plus, minus. Okay, so it's recursive. Now you can think about, oh, I can go and write a function that does that. All I have to do is take 61a, I know recursion, I'm gonna implement a two by two determinant and then those rules and then there you go. It's done. The what? Uh, there's many ways to do it, but this is, a, this, is a, this is how I'm gonna teach you. Yeah. It may end up with the same thing, but you know, you can maybe start from here and then these two, right? And like, it doesn't matter. But let's start with that. And you take CS61A, and then now you know how to program that, right, using recursion, okay? So pretty, pretty nice. Okay. Now I wanna talk about PageRank. Now PageRank is the algorithm that Google uses to, uh, um, to rank websites, and those based on how many uh, kind of links 
you know, uh, each website gets from and what's the rank of the other, other links that links to it. So if you have a, a, a website that has a high rank that points to your website, your website will also have you know, high rank. And if a lot of high rank website links to your website, it becomes even more, right? So there's all these connections that you can do, uh, you can look at by counting the number of, connect, you know, of links that comes from different websites. And you go and crawl, build a big matrix, sorry, big, a big graph, convert that graph into a matrix, and then that becomes uh, effectively what we're going to talk about now. So um, here are some faculty that teach, teaches 60, uh, 16A. Um, yours truly, um, oh no, who's right now probably, I need to add like a tissue here. Okay, I just had some drops. Okay. And uh, um, Gurija and, and Laura Waller. Okay. All right. So that's great. Now, if you look at my website, or, you know, I, yeah, I rely on all of them. So really, I link, you know, to uh, quite a bit of them. So I talk a lot to, uh, to Garija, I talk a lot to Laura, I talk a lot to, um, um, to Anna. And so you can kind of say that third of the links from my website point to Garija, third of the link from my website goes to uh, uh, Anna, and third goes to Laura. Okay, just an example. Eventually, you want to know what's the more Im most important. Okay, that's that's what basically we're trying to figure out. Okay, what about Anna? Well, Anna does talk to me, but she hasn't talked to Garija in a while. Not particular reason. I'm just like this is all in, like I just picked numbers, okay? Um, and so uh, she links half of those to me and then half to Laura, pretty much because my office and Laura's office are really close, so we just talk all the time. Um, Laura also have half of her link to Anna. She really doesn't have anything to say to me, so doesn't link anything to me and like half to half to Garija. And then Gurija, she only talks to Laura. Okay? All right. So now we've got all those links. And do you recognize what this looks like? It's like, a, it, like it's a graph, right? Like a pumps and, you know, reservoirs, your websites and links, all same, same, but different. You know, just different application, but same, same math. And we can go and write that as a state transition matrix. And what does this state transition actually would mean is, for example, if you have, let's say, um, users, let's say uh, you start with, oh, let's, let's take all the users and put them uniformly at, you know, my web page, uniformly at Laura's web page, uniformly, you know, the same amount of people looking at my page, Laura, Anna, and Gurija. And then we want to see after a while where do they spend most of their time by clicking those links and where do they end up at, okay? Same with water, right? Like where all the water goes, right? Like, you know, which reservoir would be the fuller, and things like that. So we want to build this uh, state transition matrix to really realize, you know, what is the likelihood, for example, if, you know, at the end, here it will come out to be almost a probability, you know, how much time it would spend you know, in, in a particular website, or what's the likelihood of a user, you know, you know, being at a particular website? That's another thought about, you know, how to, how to think about that. And that's how you're going to also determine how important and rank those websites and rank those faculty. All right. So how do I go about it? What is the column? Column is from me out. Row is from everybody to me. Okay, the first column. First column is from me out. The row is everything to me. Okay, so let's fill this one. Me out. So me to me, zero. Me to Anna. Me to Garija. Me to Laura, there you go, okay. All right, 
What's the next one? From Anna out. So zero, sorry, half, zero, zero, half, right? Half, zero, zero, half. Because Anna, to me, half, half to herself, a zero to herself, zero to Garija, and then half to Laura. Okay, and then you can fill the next one. Garija only sends to Laura, and then Laura sends half to uh, Garija and half to uh, Anna. Okay, all right, so now we have the matrix. That's cool. And so, really, here's the game. Now we can think of it as say transition matrix and start evolving kind of what's going on, you know? Start evolving the state and see what happens. So in fact, I can argue that X of T is really the page ranking or you know, how many people are, or what is the fraction, sorry, what is the fraction of people spending time at, um, you know, some website, okay? All right. So what we could try and see, oh, let's start with some uniform distribution. Fourth of the people will be in my website, four in Garija, four in Laura's, four in Anna, and see where they go. You want to do that? That should be fun. Is that useful? I think so. It's like a hot, you know, trillion, trillion dollar industry. Or I don't know, probably more. I mean, that's sounds important, just based on the dollar amount. Search, okay, like. All right, let's do it. We'll start with equal ranking and see what, what, where, where it's going. So what happens after t equal one? Like this, like that, like this, like that, like this, like that. I'm not gonna you know, bore you by computing that now on, on the file. I'll just tell you what the solution is. After you do one evolution, this is what you get. About eighth in my website, What's the second one? Anna. Point two in Anna's, point two in uh, Girija, and then point four in Laura's. Okay, let's keep going. Let's keep going. Well, this is two, this is three, and then you keep going, you keep going, you keep going. This is after 100 steps. After 100 steps, we got to the point where I've got 0.12 in mine, 0.24 in Anna's, 0.24 in Garija's, and 0.4 in Laura's. Okay. We can keep going, right? Can keep going? But let's just see, actually, what does it mean when we got to this point? Okay, so I got this 0 0.12, 0 0.24, 0 0.24, 0 0.4. I do like this and like that. Half times 0.24 is 0.12, right? Like this, like that. This times that. I get half times 0.24. Okay. Like this, like that. Third time 0.12, that's 0 0.04, plus half 0.4, that's 0.2, so it's 0.24. Okay. Oh, that's the same, so it's also 0.24. And then third of 0.12, that's 0.24. 0 0.4, half of 0 0.24, that's 0 0.12 plus, you know, and then uh, 1 times 0 0.24, na, 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 na. you do the calculation, it's 
0.4. So nothing has changed. Obviously, if I do 100 a second time, 100 a third time, 100 a fourth time, it's not going to change because you get the same value. If I multiply the same matrix, you know, same matrix by the same vector and I get the same thing out, nothing's going to change anymore. What I can say here that the state had reached a steady state. Okay, it converged to some steady state where things are not changing anymore. So we started this game by having equal rank, and we ended up by Laura being the most important. With 0.4 of the traffic, 40% of the traffic, Gurija and Anna having 24% of the traffic, and obviously I only get 0.12, you know, 12% of the traffic. What can you do? They're just better than I am. It's true. Okay. So it allows us to evaluate, you know, how important a website is, right? For example, or you know, how much concentration of water you get in a particular case. But that leads to an interesting interpretation of wait, there was some steady state here, right? There was some steady state here. Some, Let's, let's talk about that. I mean, that's a useful thing, right? Because maybe we don't need to compute all those you know, evolutions over and over again. Maybe we can find the steady state out of directly from a computation, right? Maybe we can do that. And so that leads us to, oh, maybe we can formulate that it's a linear set of equations that we're going to solve for the steady state directly. Solve for the steady state directly without needing to multiply like hundreds or I don't know, maybe it's going to converge after thousands, thousands of times. And you know what? I might have a billion by billion matrix or, you know, even more than that, that I need to go and prop, you know, do a multiplication all the time. That's going to be really expensive. So maybe I just need to try to compute the steady state vector directly. So let's try to talk about that in like three minutes while you take a break, all right? Let's go like this, walk around. How about we put some music? Me like 
like, ooh, that boy got bars Okay, okay, yes I do I said amen and hallelujah, let me testify to Another morning, a morning Won't let self get in my way I got my breath, I got my faith And I remember why I came I glorious, glorious Got a chance to start again I was born for this, born for this It's who I am, I could have again I made it through the Okay, refreshed, ready, can I get your attention now? It's, this, this material is very important, like every material, but to really digest what eigenvalues and vectors are, you know, once you actually understand it and like you can visualize it, it goes like, wow, you know, it's like this, this moment where you go like, holy Like really, I mean, it's like, whoa. So let's, let's talk about it. So here's a, we wanna look at the steady state, right? And the steady state that we got, if it exists, it might not exist. It may not exist. Remember the first uh, pumps and things that I told you about, remember? Like it just, oscillate between like, oh, B is moving to C, C moving to B, and it just keeps oscillating, and it's just never really converging into some single value, for example, right? That can happen too. Um, but if a steady state does exist, then I can write it in this particular case, right? In this particular way. Some matrix Q, which is a my state transition matrix, multiply by x steady state, if that's a steady state vector, well then I should get my steady state vector after that. Okay? Is q square? Is it rec rectangular? What is it? Has to be square, because just from a dimension point of view, like this, like that, and then you end up with the same size, it has to be square. Okay? So it only applies for square matrices, okay? Okay. So how do we go about, I mean, this smells like a linear set of equations, right? I got some, something that multiplies but some unknowns, and then, oh, but wait, it looks, but equals to unknown. Like, multiply by unknown, equal to unknown. So it smells like linear equation. It looks like, but kind of like not exactly. Remember, like, you had in the homework some situation about, you know, when you wanted to stitch like a, uh, like a panorama and you put this in a linear equation, but, but, you know, your variables were in the matrix and, you know, the things that you didn't know, the things that you, you, you know, were like outside or inside, you know, it just didn't look like exactly. And you massaged it such that it actually looked like a linear, sorry, looked like a linear equation. That's what we're going to do now. It smells like a linear equation that we can solve with Gaussian elimination.
but it's not like enough. So let's try to massage it. Right? We want to make it like look like AX equal B. You know? That's what we want to make it look like. Right now, it looks like AX equals X. How can I make it like AX equal B? Well, I'm just going to collect all my variables in one side of the equation. So I'm going to move x steady state to the other side where, like this. Can I do that? x times s, xs, q times xss minus xss equals 0. Can I, can I do that? Can I? All right. Hmm. So the, the, this is a common multiplier, right? Of what, though? Hmm? Yeah, so this is a little bit uh, tough. Like, what, what is, when I have, I have Q times XSS, but I have, not, like, nothing times XSS, and I want to f take XSS out. And I just want you to realize, when you have a vector, it's the same if I want to write x. God. If I want to write x, I can also write it as i times x. Right? i times x equals x. Oh, wait, is q identity matrix? Because that, that would have been. Right? If Q was an identity matrix. So here's the weird, stuff about, weird things about matrices, right? Like, that's, the, that's so cool. Like, sometimes now I have something times that equals zero, and it's not zero, that, that thing. And now I've got, like, something, something is the same, but it's not the identity matrix. It's crazy. Whoa. What is going on? OK, so I'm just going to write it this way, right? So some Q minus something equals XSS, right? But what is this something? It's the identity matrix, right? So I can basically write it this way, right? I can write it as Q minus I times XSS equals 0. Whoa! <laughs> Q minus I is the matrix. XSS is a vector equals 0. What did we cover in the beginning of the class? We talked about null space. What's the definition of null space? Exactly that. So what is XSS, the steady state vector? It's a null space vector. It's a vector that lives in the null space of the matrix Q minus I. Okay, not Q, not the null space of the matrix U, but the null space of the matrix Q minus I. How can I find it? How can I find XSS? You subtract one of the diagonals of Q and? Gosh, an elimination. Not the game, but the algorithm. That's right. We know how to solve it. And we can solve it, and now we find it directly. Don't need to iterate in order to do that. Yeah. All the elements of Q has to be less than 1. I don't know. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Okay, well, that's cool, right? So the null space of Q minus I is a steady state solution. So any, by the way, any scalar of XSS, it's still the null space of Q minus I, and it's still a steady state vector. Right? I scale XSS by 5, it still would be true. Right? I would get just at the end XSS times 5. So it is a space. Okay? All right. So we saw an example for steady state vector. What does it really kind of, what does it kind of mean? Remember that when you take some vector, 
and you pass it through, like you, you multiply a matrix, you, you multiply a matrix by that vector, normally that matrix would, you know, scale, would shrink, would rotate, reflect, you know, do this transformation on that vector. What is so special by this vector XSS? It's the same. It's like, let's say you're a vector. What's your name? Kozu. You're a vector. You come in, you're not a steady state. I'm going to tell you shrink, rotate, <laughs> flip. All right? Shrink, rotate, flip. Come on. Flip. All right, no, flip. flip. <laughs> and what about you? Come on. You're also not a steady state vector. So you come into my matrix. OK. Expand, jump, rotate, flip, <laughs> reflect. Reflect on what you uh, just experienced. <laughs> right? That's, that's what it does. And let's say you hey, come over. Let's say you're a steady state vector and I'm, I'm a matrix. Oh, please just. Stay as you are. Stay as you are. You're perfect. Thank you. So steady state vectors are pretty much are not affected. They keep the same direction, the same length, everything when they go into the matrix. Right? That's pretty cool. That's, that's a very interesting property. So what I want to look now is a little bit of a more general case. Okay, right now I got the steady state vector and we, we saw that it was useful because it gave us, for example, you know, the rank of pages and stuff like that. But I want to look at a more general case. And the more general case is a situation where I have a vector that go inside the matrix, but that vector doesn't exactly stay the same but at least they, kept, they get to keep their direction. Their direction doesn't change, but maybe they can be, you know, scale up, scale down, but they stay in the same direction. They're not rotated, reflected, and so on and so forth. Okay? So in the general case, what I'm going to have is I'm going to have Q times X would be equal to some lambda times X. Now, the analogy to what we have before is that here lambda was 1. But I'm just going to look at a more general case where lambda is not 1. Okay. So that's pretty cool. If we have such a vector for a particular matrix such that when it goes into the matrix, this matrix multiplies it, it only shrinks or expands or stays the same. In that case we say something about this. We say that x is an eigenvector of q. It's eigen in German means self. So it's a self vector of q. It's a self vector of the matrix q with an eigenvalue, a self value of lambda. That's what it means. In this case, xss is a self vector or an eigenvector of q with an eigenvalue of 1. In this case, it would be a self vector of or an eigenvector of Q with an eigenvalue of lambda. And I would also say that the span of X is the associated eigenspace of the matrix Q that is associated with that particular eigenvalue lambda. Okay? It's an eigenspace. Now why is it an eigenspace? Because actually any vector within the span of X should still satisfy that, right? If I, if I know that Q times X equals lambda X and I put, you know, 2X in, I'm just going to get lambda times 2X, right? So it's still within the eigenspace, OK? That's pretty cool. So here's a situation where I have X. And let's say I give you an arbitrary matrix. And I don't, you don't even know what the matrix is. You don't know what the matrix is. 
I'm telling you X is an eigenvector of that matrix associated with some eigenvalue lambda. And I'm going to ask you what happens to this vector if the eigenvalue is 1. What would happen to the vector when you have q times x? Stays the same. I didn't tell you what the matrix is. I didn't tell you what x is. Right, well, I kind of showed you this particular one, but you know, I just told you it's an eigenvector. And now I'm telling you eigenvalue is 1, and you know exactly what's going to happen. You don't need to compute anything. That's powerful. What if lambda is bigger than 1? Q times x. What would happen? The result will not change direction. It will keep the same direction, and it would expand. The result will be lambda times x. And if I keep doing that, again, q times whatever I got the result, q times that, q times that, q times that, what would happen? Expand and expand and expand and expand by lambda till it explodes. Right? Remember when we had a non-conservative system that, you know, that things exploded? That's how we know that things could explode if we know that there's an eigenvalue that is bigger than 1. What happens if eigenvalue is actually less than 1? What would happen to x? Its direction? Stay the same. What happens to its length? Shrinks. And then I keep going. Q times x, Q times, you know, to the, the result, Q times that, Q times Q squared, Q, Q cubed, Q to the fourth. Uh, actually, I didn't mean greater than zero. If it's uh, less than zero, but its magnitude, sorry, uh, is less than one, then it would just be negative but shrunk. And then again, it will be positive but shrunk. And then, you know, just flip size. But it would keep the same direction, you know, the same line. That's what I mean by that direction. It might flip, you know, sides, but it's still on the same, you know, the span is not going to change. Okay? That's, that's a good point. So actually what I meant is that. Okay, that's, that's very interesting. So here are definitions. Let Q be a matrix that is square has to be square. We're not dealing with non-square matrices. 16B would deal with non-square matrices. We learn about singular values and singular vectors. But now we're going to talk about eigenvalues and eigenvectors of square matrices. And then lambda is in R. Now, in general, those lambdas are actually complex, not in 16A. 16B, they're going to be complex. 16A, we're just going to deal with real eigenvalues. But in general, eigenvalues are actually complex valued. Okay? Now, if there exists a vector x that is not 0, such that q times x equals lambda x, of course, 0 vector still works, right? Right? 0 vector. So if, if it's not 0 vector, then lambda is an eigenvalue of q, and x is an eigenvector of q associated with that eigenvalue, and the null space of q minus lambda i, that matrix q minus lambda i, it's the eigenspace of that matrix. Wow, I threw a lot of definitions here. Yeah. It could be it could be trivial eigen. Uh, no, not, not all matrices have eigenvalue zero. No, 
not all matrices have eigenvalue zero, but they could, but the I, but zero vector could be in, you know, it is an eigenvector. Obviously, if this is zero, if lambda is zero, then that is not necessarily true, right? Because if I pick a Q that it's not zero, it's not in null space X, it's not in null space of Q, then it's like, oh, then it doesn't work, okay? So that's not true. So this is in a definition, so I'm gonna repeat again. If you have such X, such that QX equals lambda X, then lambda is the eigenvalue of X, and X vector, uh, sorry, of Q, and then the X vector is an eigenvector of the matrix Q, and the null space of Q minus lambda I, it's the eigenspace. And the eigenvectors span the eigenspace of the matrix uh, uh, Q minus lambda I, okay? Does that make sense? All right. So now the real question is, how do you compute them? How do you compute them? And that's where we're gonna spend the rest of the class today, just computing eigenvalues, okay? And eigenvectors. And the way that we're gonna compute them is using the determinant. That's why we taught you about the determinant. So th the thing is that there's two things that we need to find. We, need, like we have a matrix, but we want to find lambda and we want to find x that's associated with it. There's two things, right? Q times x equals lambda times x. Hold on, is this linear? Is this a linear problem? Our variables are x and our variable is lambda. Is this a linear problem? Yes or no? I mean, who says yes? Is this linear? Okay, who says no? Who doesn't know? You've got lambda multiplying x. Both of them are variables that you want to solve for. Do they obey homogeneity and superposition if you have two variables multiplying each other? No, it is not linear. This is one of the special cases where the problem is nonlinear, but we know how to solve it. Okay? Huh, cool. One of those special cases, it's nonlinear, but it's decoupled. We can solve for lambda separately, and then it becomes a linear problem for solving for x. Okay? And that's how we're gonna do it. We're gonna solve for lambda first, and then once we found the lambda that satisfy what we want, then we find associated x. Okay, so we really need, we really need to find some qx minus lambda x equals zero, which is q minus lambda i times x equals zero. And we want to find x that is in null space of q minus lambda i, right? That's what we want to find. The thing is we just don't know don't know what is lambda, but I can still write it down. I can write down Q minus lambda I. What is Q lambda minus lambda I? Well, if this is Q minus lambda I, it's lambda on the, diag you know, on the diagonal. And so the matrix that I get is half minus lambda, zero, half, and one minus lambda. That is the matrix Q. I need to find lambda and I need to find x such that this matrix times x equals lambda x. Huh. So find lambda. Once we find lambda, we find x. Okay. How do we find lambda? But why? Why determinant? What? So you want to find a lambda such that the matrix Q minus lambda I has a non-trivial null space, right? That's what we want to find. We want to find lambdas such that Q minus lambda I have non-trivial null space because if it doesn't have, then it's not an eigenvalue. It's not an eigenvalue. Like it has to have a null space. That's what we want to find. 
Now, we know that if the determinant is zero, then it has a null space. So let's find the determinant and figure out what lambdas satisfy the determinant being zero. Then we make sure that it has a null space. And then once we have those lambdas that have the associated null space, then we can find those vectors that associate with them. Okay? That's the, that's the key. So we want to find lambdas that result in a non-trivial null space. So we compute the determinant of q minus lambda i and going to force that to be equal to 0. Okay? Is that a linear problem? It isn't. This is the roots, finding the roots of a polynomial. Because, oh, sorry, I said the roots of a is that, a, well, I don't know. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But we need to find the determinant, right? The determinant is, right? That's the determinant. I'm going to write it down. It's half minus lambda times 1 minus lambda minus 0 times half. OK. Is this linear? No, you got lambda multiplying by lambda. This is lambda squared. Nonlinear. Have you solved this before? Yeah, that's finding roots of a polynomial. Polynomial in lambda. In fact, every time that you compute a determinant of q minus lambda i, you're going to get a polynomial in lambda. If it's a 2 by 2 matrix, it's going to be second order polynomial. If it's a 3 by 3, it's a third order polynomial. If it's a 4, four by 4, it's going to be a fourth order polynomial. So it's finding the roots of a polynomial. It's not necessarily trivial, but it is solvable. Okay, we know how to solve these. Do we know what the roots here? Hell yeah, we know. It's like we just look at it and like we know we factor it, right? But it's already factored because this is zero. And so if lambda equal one, it will be zero. And if lambda equals half, it will also be zero. So now I see two solutions. Okay, there's two solutions, two eigen values for this matrix. It is so special, this polynomial, it's called the Schrödinger's polynomial. It's called the Schrödinger's polynomial. Characteristic polynomial. Okay? It's called the characteristic polynomial. Very special polynomial. Okay? So now I've got a two solution, lambda 1 equal half Lambda 2 equal 1. What's the next steps? Now we need to find x's associated with each lambdas. So now we're going to plug in, plug in lambda equal 1 and find a vector that spans the null space of q minus 1 times i. And then after that we find them, we're going to look for, we're going to take plug in lambda equal half, and then find the null space of q minus half times i. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. OK? So q minus lambda i, we want to find the, la la you want to find the null space of that. OK? So we're going to pick first lambda 1 equal half. Now I'm going to substitute half instead of lambda. So I'm going to get 0, half, 0, half. Yeah? You see that's going to have a null space? 0, half, 0, half? It's going to have a null space. Why? Because we, that's what we, we found the lambdas that would reach a, a null space, right? Like that's, that's, that's by design, it's going to have a null space. Okay. So half minus half. Half, half, you know. And that equals 0, 0, half, half, times x equals 0. So now, gauge elimination of a 2 by 2 matrix. Not too difficult. And we have something that looks like this. So let me argue then that I'm going to have like, kind of like, you know, I scale it by, by you know, multiply by 2, and I get 1, 1, 0, 0. So now, 
my solution will be x1 equals minus x2, where x1 is the first element of x vector, and x2 is the second element of vector, right? If that is true, then this set is satisfied, right? Can you see that, right? This is x1, this is x2. When I add them together, they equal 0. OK. So I'm going to say that x, the vector x1 associated with lambda 1, is the span of the vector 1 minus 1. Why 1 minus 1? Because it's all vectors that have a shape where x is minus x, x1 is x minus x2, which is true here. Is 2 minus 2 also an eigenvector? Yes. Is 3 minus 3 also an eigenvector? Yes. Because it's the span of 1 minus 1. OK, we found this is an eigenvector, and this is an eigenvalue. OK, great. What about lambda 2? Lambda 2 equal 1. Now satis substitute that. Let's substitute. 1 half minus 1, half, 0, 1 minus 1. Guess what? This column is 0. Uh, obviously, it has a null space. OK? All right, minus half, half. And then now Gaussian elimination. I'm going to get 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. What does that actually mean? What does it actually mean? If I pick a random x, what will be then the solution? Well, basically, x1 is 0. Like, it's always 0, right? That's, that's what it means. Because whatever I pick for x2, then x1 has to be 0. Otherwise, when I add them together, you know, right? Does it make sense? So x1 has to be 0. So x2 is in the span of 0, 1. Well, that's cool. OK, so um, that is the eigenspace. This is now the eigenspace of the matrix Q associated with eigenvalue 1. And let's just pick a vector and see if it works. Here's the vector 2 minus 2. I'm going to take half, half, 0, and 1, multiply by that. What am I supposed to get? <laughs> 